If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. There is a commandment that we look at today based upon our series called the Ten Commandments. We find ourselves at commandment number eight. Always give the disclaimer that for anybody that's new to CBC, your friend, your family member, your coworker or classmate did not invite you because they felt like you needed to hear this particular teaching on the commandment. Specifically this one, you shall not steal. But as we talk about stealing today, we believe that there is a bigger narrative, I believe, for all of us to understand than just don't take stuff from other people. As I was approaching this particular sermon after delivering a message of thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not commit adultery, I thought this would be a weekend where we would feel a little bit of a respite, like, okay, we're good, God. I think we've learned this. And then the Holy Spirit of God began to open Pandora's box of how this applies to all of us. So today my encouragement to you is understand that this commandment is about a heart issue and all of us will walk out of this place with something to work on. But I want to begin with this target statement. To love God requires us to love people. And to steal from people is not only an offense to people, but also an offense towards God. This is the reason why this commandment finds itself in the Ten Commandments is because the Ten Commandments can be broken down into two statements, love God, love people. Love God, love people. And when we choose to steal from other people, it's not loving people, and it's also an offense to God because we're not loving God. Now, as we get to this particular teaching, point number one, I want you to write this down today. We see the clarification in this command. The clarification in this command. It really does give perspective on personal property. When the Bible speaks to thou shalt not steal, it's actually clarifying for us that personal property is a good thing. Thus, communism and socialism, the idea of communism, the government owns everything. Can I use it in proper English? Ain't nobody for that. Socialism, everybody owns everything, but we have to ask the question, but who fairly and equally distributes all those things? And ain't nobody for that either. And when we talk about those ideas, there's this kingdom principle that comes with entrepreneurship, equal opportunity to every race and every person based upon their skill set and not where they're from, but the talent, the gift, and the ability that God's placed in their heart to make a living for themselves, but to operate in radical generosity in doing so. Like Ephesians 4.28 would say that. Like make a living and provide for those around you that are in need. So when we talk about personal property, all of us at some point have possibly been victimized by theft. I remember my bicycles being stolen as a kid. But recently, a couple years ago, I was at lunch just down the road from the church. My car was broken into. My backpack was stolen. My laptop was in my backpack. My, my Bible was in my backpack that I had had for so many years as I crisscrossed around the country asking teenagers that gave their life to Jesus to sign my Bible. It was like this family heirloom that I was going to pass on to my kids. Gone. The blue dot, as I pinged my laptop, are y'all with me today when I say the blue dot, when you could track where that laptop or phone is at, revealed itself that it was by Costco right down the road, Residence Inn and Krispy Kreme. And I'm getting hungry just even mentioning Krispy Kreme. (laughs) And I found myself so wounded by the fact that they had taken my laptop, taken my backpack, taken my Bible. By the way, I'd just written a textbook for a college in Oklahoma. And that textbook, this paper that would turn into a textbook, was due just a few days later after my backpack was stolen. I'd worked on it for weeks and months. I know I was supposed to save it to the cloud, whatever that fully means, but I'd never really did that. I didn't have it on a jump drive. It was on my laptop, gone. Had to rewrite an entire textbook again. So I find myself, I'm mad. I'm angered. I want my Bible back. 
I want my laptop back. I get the blue dot. It's by the Costco. And I'm thinking somebody up in this resident inn, there's a hotel right there by the blue dot, has got my stuff. And with an accountability partner, I talked to the manager at the front desk. Sweet lady was like, Pastor Ed, what brings you into the residence inn? I li- listen, I was like, somebody up in this hotel has got my stuff. <laughs> True story. I walk every floor pressing my phone, which would create an alert, tracking my laptop. I'm walking door by door, waiting. Every door, nothing. I believe my Bible's gonna show up at some point in some Salvation Army and some Goodwill. It's gonna be a sweet day when I get reunited with that Bible, but I'm telling you, have you ever had that moment where something was taken from you and you were angered? To that point of going, I want restoration. Now think about this. When we choose to take something from someone else, it is infringing upon personal property. The Bible actually encourages us to have personal property, but there's only two ways of correctly gaining something. One, you work for it, and two, you're gifted it. Any other way of obtaining and acquiring goes against this particular commandment. Now, when we talk about this idea of ownership and stewardship, let's break it down to such a very fundamental level. God owns everything. Everything is is God's. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord and the fullness therein and even the people that dwell therein. So let me just use this analogy. If I were to say this is my suit, which it is, I bought it with my own money right here at Men's Warehouse. So this is my suit, tailor-made for me. You can't come take this suit. I'm obviously at 170 pounds uh, You might be able to take me and take my suit from me, but I'll bite you. I'll I'll, I'll try to do something. I'll scratch you. I'll karate kick you in the shin. I don't, I don't, but you need to know, all right? So this is my suit. Nobody can come and take it. I'm just using just a simple analogy. Now, I can give you this suit if you want it, but think about it this way. But really, when I use this term, this is my suit. I bought it with my own money. Take a step back. Where did I get that talent, gift, and ability to actually get a job, get money? Where did that breath come from to be alive? Do you see how we can just take a step back and go, all right, yes, I've worked for it. Yes, I've acquired it. But when I start taking a couple steps back, one, God's given me the ability, which means he's the owner of everything. And he has entrusted to me the possessions that we have. Now, listen to me, church. There's nothing wrong with wanting nice stuff. But there is a dangerous, slippery slope when our stuff starts owning us. So we can't get that backwards. And that's greed at the, at the heart of this. And so this idea of God owning everything, God is the blesser of good things in our life. He is the good and perfect heavenly father that bestows good gifts upon his kids. James 1.27 would teach us. But we're to live open-handed, which means that we are not to live tight-fisted because I really don't own anything. But I've been entrusted to the things that I have in my possession, which means I'm to be a steward of everything, to take care of the stuff that's in my possession, not to have a flippant mindset of, I'll just get another, but to recognize when it comes to stuff, God is the giver of these things, and I'm to be a steward of them. But the moment I choose to take something from someone else, watch this, it's an indirect statement that God can't meet your needs. So God, you've not given me what I want, so I'll take it from someone else. And God goes, not only is that an offense towards that person, it's an offense towards me. You see how this works together. Remember the story about the rich young ruler? Comes to Jesus and is like, hey man, I wanna go to heaven. Jesus goes, cool. Sell all your stuff, give it to the poor. He's like, uh, why? Jesus, not teaching that the only way to heaven is to give to the poor. Jesus is the only way to heaven. But what he was doing was revealing in the heart of the rich young ruler was he was an idolater of his stuff. And by the fact that he could not live open-handed was actually a direct offense towards God because he loved his stuff more than God. See how Jesus always goes after the heart? He's a master surgeon. 
He uses the word of God like a scalpel and gets to the core of the issue. Listen to me. The message we preach here at CBC is not religion. Religion is like putting band-aids over bullet wounds. But the word of God through the spirit of God is like Neosporin. It goes to the heart of the infection and begins to help us understand that this is about heart transformation, not just behavior modification. And Jesus begins to address this concept with us today. Because when it comes to stealing, it's, and I'm, I'm doing some hand motions because I'm trying to just sear this into your mind, taking something and making it yours is a form of stealing. But at the same time, keeping something from someone that's theirs is stealing. So watch this. Taking, keeping falls into the category of stealing. That is the clarification. Number two, write this down. We see the consideration in this command. Now, these four words, four words, break down into four categories. You go ahead. What's the four words again? Thou shall not steal. Do not steal. We can break it down to three words, but it gives us four categories, such as what is stealing, confiscating what is not yours, consuming something as if it is yours, conniving to make it yours, and cheating to say it's yours. It breaks into four categories, all in your notes. But when we talk about confiscating what's not yours, it works itself into the category, and this is category number one, talking about employment, employment, such as Titus chapter 2 verse 10 would say, do not pilfer, means to skim off the top, that we as employees should not be stealing from the company that we work for, such as we show up late, leave early, but yet we say we worked a full eight hours. That's stealing from the company. Literally, companies are being cost billions of dollars because of what's known as employee theft, taking supplies. And I work at the company. Now, let me break this down to you. I'm using a monitor. If you ever wonder what I'm looking at, I'm not just looking at the clock. I'm looking at a monitor. I have three of them. So don't be too impressed. I haven't memorized this entire message. I have confidence monitors. You can come take a look at them after the service. You'll see this. The singers use the words on the screen. I use this as a way of just looking at my outline. The only thing that's on this monitor is the same thing that's on your listener guide. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is because if I took this TV that's right here in front of me and said, my son would love to use this in his bedroom to play Xbox on. How would you feel about that? Not cool. It belongs to the church. It's an infringement upon who, belong, who it belongs to. Now, you go, Ed, that's a little bit different. But when we talk about supplies from work, companies are missing so many things because employees go, well, I work here. That's my right. No, listen. And I say this because I know nobody's doing this, but I just need to say this just in case you know somebody that's doing this. You could tell them on behalf of me what I said, that what they're doing is wrong, all right? They're stealing from the company. But let me say this to supervisors and CEOs and managers. Not only do employees have a tendency to steal from the company, but so do supervisors and managers and CEOs from the employee, which means they show up early, they stay late, and they're not fairly compensated for the number of hours they have been working. That's stealing from the employee. So does that make sense? It's a give and take issue. But let me talk to you about just this principle of the subsidies not to work. Subsidies, not to work. Now, the Bible's always got a better way of saying it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. I put this reference in your notes, but let me just read this to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 10, or chapter 3, verse 10. It says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That's a strong statement. That's, I'm not even reading from the message translation. That's like straight up. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, checking Facebook, extended lunch hours, chopping it up in the hallway, just busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their living, to earn their own living. Now I want to make a statement to give clarification to this idea of subsidies not to work. I'm grateful that we live in the United States of America and the democracy in which we have. 
I'm grateful for government agencies that come alongside of people in moments and seasons of hardship. Being raised by two deaf people, my mom was cerebral palsy, registered handicapped by our country. My mom, my dad, government, disability, social security, disability. We made it because of government subsidies. I lived in government subsidized housing. My mom, eventually, because of what's known as the ADA, the American Disability Act, was given equal opportunity. My dad was in carpentry. He was a construction worker, could not get a job because people would make statements like this. What if something falls from the roof and we warn you, you can't move, you get hurt, you're a liability. Listen, folks, we can't use words like that today. But I was growing up and listening to my dad say he couldn't get a job, let go, hired, let go, hired, let go, hired, for any and various reason that had something to do with his disability. My mom started off as a minimum wage worker at the United States Post Office and retired 20 years later in the finance department because during a rush of a Christmas season, they need somebody with some mathematical ability. And my mom stepped in, volunteered, and said, I know a little bit about math. And she never left the financial department and served for 20 years, starting off sorting mail. But the American Disability Act gave her that opportunity. And they were, they were being seen as people that had skill instead of being looked at as people that had disability. So I say this in parentheses. I am grateful for a country that recognizes hardship and comes alongside of people in moments of difficulty. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in this particular message, now buckle up, for those who are able and capable of working, but choose to stay home because they're getting a subsidy and making more money staying at home and not going to work. Now, listen, I know none of you are doing this, but you got some friends that are doing this. And let me tell you how this is working. And I say this in love. This is how this is working. There is supply and there's demand. And what's going on right now, there's a lot of demand and there's a shortage of supply. Which means when there's a shortage of supply, milk gets the $5 a gallon. You go, Ed, that won't happen. Oh, just hang on. Gas starts getting over $4, $5. Here's the reason why. Because factories and places of employment, everybody's hiring. That's what we've seen in our city. Everybody's hiring. But we do not have enough workers because this statement is being said and shared. I make more money collecting from the government than I do at that job. So why would I go and go work at that job and make less than what the government's giving me? I'm going to make a hard statement, and I will not apologize for it. It is robbing God. It is robbing God. You go, Ed, how? It's legal. It's legal. Let me tell you how it's legal. Our government, and shame on our government, They need to be held accountable to these actions of allowing people to be prolonged in a state of unemployment because they're making more money. If you're able and capable, I'm not talking about hardship. I'm talking about people that are just collecting checks and not going to the place of establishment of working. And what I'm saying is that's a hard issue. Here's the reason why. Let me break this down to you because you got a gift and a talent and an ability that God has given you that you're not using that's, that's what I mean by robbing God. God goes, I gave you that to use, but you're collecting, sitting, waiting for that to run out. Then you're going to go look for a job. Meanwhile, now watch this, it's not only robbing from God, but it's also robbing from your neighbor because prices are skyrocketing and it's affecting everyone else that's trying to do the right thing and trying to stimulate our economy again. And things are being driven to a point of it's not available. And there are shortages everywhere. But the demand is still here. It's just no workers, no supply. So my heart for us today is to understand as CBC people, Jesus people. Now listen to me. Some of you in the room are going, I didn't come to church to hear this today. Well, once more, I'm not assuming that you're doing this. You're going to go tell your friend about this, and you're going to make this right with your friend and go, hey, listen, Pastor Ed said, man, what you're doing ain't right. 
So I, I just, I just, because I know you're a CBCer. And a CBCer shows up at the workplace, gives their very best, doesn't cheat the company, doesn't cheat the employee, demonstrates integrity, conviction, calling. God's given you an ability. So you live in integrity in such a way. That's my heart and prayer. Now, if you're in the room going, Ed, listen, you're getting all up in my business today, man. I say this in love. I say this in love. It's affecting our country. It's affecting our communities. It's affecting the world in which we live. And one of the ways that we could love our neighbor is to work. To work. Proper means of gains. Yes, working in generosity. But to take advantage of something for an extended period of time is incorrect. And as the people of God, we should live differently. We should act differently. I can't fault people that don't know Jesus. But for us, there's an accountability that we should walk in, a different level of integrity. But when it comes to this idea of do not steal, it breaks into another category in regards to not be a consumer as if it's yours. This is the idea of entitlement. And let me say this to to an older generation. Let's be very careful when we speak about a younger generation. Don't lump them into a category of entitlement. I've met a lot of young men and young ladies that straight up got hustled. I met a lot of young men and young ladies that got grit and tenacity that are going after it. And I know we can easily lump them into categories of millennials and Gen Xers. Let's just be careful not to use blanket statements because it's discouraging some young people that are trying to do the right thing, trying to live a life of earning a wage. But when we speak to the idea of being a consumer, all of us are guilty of this. We're takers, takers. But what God's teaching us is not to be a taker, but to be a giver. Because it's blessed in the method in which we operate when we choose to be a giver than to be a taker. But when it comes to conniving to make it yours, this falls into the category of extortion, exploitation, and evasion. Extortion is seeking to gain something by threatening someone else. That's called blackmail. You are using and leveraging something for personal gain that's at the detriment and the harm of someone else. The Bible goes, that's stealing. Exploitation is a means of personal gain at the expense of someone else's weakness or lack thereof in regards to resources. Now, ain't nobody talking about this, but there's nearly 50 million slaves in the world right now. Right now, and ain't nobody talking about this. As you look at a map, this is not Pastor Ed, but when you look at a map and you see all the different places where there is slavery, highlighted different countries, North America, United States is not one of them. Because some bold men and women said, we want to fix the unfortunate situation of how our country was founded, and we want to course correct this, and we still have a stain in our history. But praise God, we move forward and still got a lot of work to do. But as we look to what's taking place in the world, ain't nobody talking about 18.4 million slaves in India right now. Ain't nobody talking about 3.4 million slaves in China right now. Ain't nobody talking about the millions of slaves in Bangladesh, North Korea. Ain't nobody talking about that. But I will. It is a form of exploitation (laughs) unto labor and sex trafficking. But what is in our country right now, and I'm so grateful for Chief McManus, our San Antonio Police Department, with the task force, with, with the regard of addressing the trafficking that's taking place in our own city. I'm grateful. When you hear on the news of a truck in some parking lot and all of a sudden people come out of the back of it, 50 plus folks, half of them about to die because of the heat and the dehydration. This is a form of trafficking that's taking place in our city. We're at a highway and byway in our city and they're going to various places, many of which are going into labor camps, maybe even going into a space where they're being exploited, trafficking. For sexuality. The Bible says that's stealing. You go, Ed, what's stealing? Their dignity, their worth, their value. You're stealing their worth, 
their value, their dignity. That is exploitation. Evasion. Tax. Evasion. To the rich, to the middle class, to the low income, at any level, when we're looking for loopholes and ways and trying to figure out how we can hide and shelter so we do not properly be taxed on the revenue that we've generated. Now listen to me. We have to operate in integrity with our taxes. Do not seek to cheat on your taxes. Once more, I cannot fault non-Jesus people, but they should know better. I'm talking to Jesus people. We should do better in our taxes. Now, once more, I'm not talking to you directly, but if you got some friends, please speak up. Please speak up. But this is the concept of evasion. Mark 12 says, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. I'll be honest with you, I wish Jesus said something different. But think about it. The Jewish nation was taxed 80% by the Roman Empire. Ain't nobody for increasing taxes. I promise you. Ain't nobody for that. But when we think about operating in character and integrity, these things matter. But to cheat to say it's yours, plagiarism. I'm going to talk to an older generation of people. Do you remember how we used to have to do research papers? You actually had to go to the library card catalog you're like who is this Dewey guy (laughs) never even heard of this Dewey guy and why is there so many decibels and how do I find a book in their technology for this yeah we had what was called microfish four of you are clapping because you remember that nowadays my kids, your kids, your grandkids, they can go to the internet. Copy, paste. Then some educators got real savvy with some technology. And they run all these term papers through this scanning device and spits back a percentage, letting them know how much they plagiarized. Accountability. Plagiarism. Taking something that belongs to someone else and saying you did it. Stealing. Piracy, illegal downloading, buckle up, using someone else's Netflix account. Gotcha. You're like, I was good all the way up. (laughs) Personalizing personalizing New York City Louis Gucci's Michael Kor on blankets on sidewalks $20 pleather plastic leather looks just like it now listen don't think I'm going to stand up on this stage and act like I've never done something like this I bought a Rolex and a Polo one time Bought a Rolex watch in the second hand. If you know anything about Rolexes, the second hand does not tick. It's a smooth circle. It was ticking. And the Rolex symbol, after about four days, fell off its place and fell down to the bottom. That polo shirt I had from a distance looked legit till you got up on it and the horse's legs were crooked. We've all been there. But you go, Ed, I didn't do anything illegal, but they're making a profit once more. Now think about this. And we don't even know what type of labor they're a part of to even sell that. That they may be being owned by somebody else to sell that. So all this is is just causing us to pause and check our hearts, operate in integrity, personalizing. Now, we get to this next principle, point number four. Write this down. I want you to notice point number four that would help us understand, actually point number three that would speak to the conviction in this command. What's the conviction in this command? It demands, this is letter A, letter B. Write this down. This demands that we live in personal character. Character. Who you are when nobody's watching. And who you are when everybody's watching. 
Stealing is dishonest. Stealing is deceptive. Buckle up. I've said it three times. Stealing is demonic. You go, Ed, how? John 10, verse 10, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, destroy. Who is it talking about? Satan. So he's talking about. So it doesn't reflect the character of God. When we talked about letter B in regards to living in purposeful consideration, so how are we supposed to live? Philippians chapter 2 gives us the example of Jesus. Give consideration, get consent, give credit. Don't look out just for your own selfish ambition. Count others more significant than yourself and look out for someone else's interest. By stealing, we're not doing those things. So the Bible deals with us about character and consideration. My favorite preacher who's passed away is in heaven. His name is Dr. Adrian Rogers. He pastored a church called Bellevue Baptist. He goes to a Hallmark store to buy a gift for his, his wife, Joyce, for their anniversary. In a rush, he takes the money, puts it back in his wallet, and goes about his business. Next day, begins to go to work, notices his wallet's a little disheveled, begins to arrange and organize his wallet, and notices that he's got more money in his wallet than he should from the previous day after that expenditure. And he recognizes that where he got additional money was from the Hallmark store. They gave back more money than what they should, so he went to make it right. He goes back to the Hallmark store, waits in line, same clerk behind the counter, ma'am, yesterday I purchased this item and you gave me too much money, I just wanted to come and bring it back. She's made this statement, she goes, I know, excuse me, you, you know that you gave me too much money? She goes, yes, I did it on purpose. She goes, I know you're the pastor of the big church down the road. I see you on TV. And I've been in your church. I just wanted to see if you had practiced what you preach. She goes, obviously you do. And then she made this statement. She goes, I'll be the young college student walking down the aisle at the end of the service coming to join your church because I can sit under a man that practices what he preaches. This is character. It doesn't just apply to me, it applies to all of us. Somebody's watching. But most of all, God is watching. But point number four, write this down. Not only do we see the conviction in this command, but we also see the calling in this command. You remember our boy Zacchaeus, the wee little man, up in the sycamore tree, saw Jesus. Jesus said, I want to go to your house. Now, if you know anything, you've probably watched Chosen or you read this in the Bible, tax collectors were not popular people. They were known for exploiting individuals, taking advantage of those less fortunate. Jesus goes, I want to go to your house. Listen to this in Luke 19, verse 8. The Bible says, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if, uh, if I have defrauded, which means to rob anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. Fourfold. I was speaking at a camp in Georgia. Had some rainbow flip-flops. If you know anything about that, it, it was a gift. They were about $45 to $50 pair of flip-flops. Lifetime warranty on these flip-flops for wear and tear. And I went to go play basketball with a group of dudes. I kicked my flip-flops on, put my hoop shoes on. And then I get done playing, and I just run off to this next engagement. I forget my shoes. The camp comes to an end. Long story short, two weeks later, get a box in the mail and an apology letter. Dear Pastor Ed, I'm so sorry for stealing your flip-flops. Please forgive me. See, when I went back to go get those flip-flops, they were gone. And he took them, was wearing them, and because his friends played basketball with me, recognized that he had my shoes on, and asked him, did Pastor Ed give you those shoes? Hashtag busted. And at that moment, he looked at his friends and he went, no. No. He didn't. Convicted. It's one thing to be convicted. It's another thing to mail back back flip-flops and make it right. And Zacchaeus, with that same heart as this young man that I met, listen, in that moment goes, I was wrong, but I want to make it right. My prayer from a message like this is that we would all walk out of here and go, so how do I make some stuff right? To go back to the places and spaces that God has put us in and choose to make it right. To own it. On what? Our choices. 
And to simply look at people and go, hey, man, I'm sorry. I did not reflect the character in which I desire to live in, and I did not reflect the character that Christ calls me to, and would you please forgive me? But when it comes to our finances, it's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, where God says, so how do you say that you've robbed me? God goes, from the tithe and the offering. That we keep what's ours. Now listen, the only time we ever talk about money here at CBC is when we talk about what we're doing with money. Matter of fact, I have faced some criticism for doing what we do with the 90-day tithing challenge. I've had some individuals that would say, Ed, it's hokey and it's gimmicky. You shouldn't reward people for just doing what the Bible tells them to do. And my response is obviously trying to be winsome. I go, sir, listen to me. You can't hold people accountable to a brand new relationship with Jesus that they have in comparison to you walking with Jesus for 40 years and understand what the Bible says. And some people need to just be encouraged and inspired to just believe what the Bible says because some of which have never heard this before that we're to take 10% of what God has blessed us with and give it back to God through our local church. They've never heard that before. So when we do a 90-day tithing challenge, we're not trying to be gimmicky. We want people to live in the blessing in which God has called them to. That's what we're asking. And at the end of the 90 days, we're actually saying that money that's acquired, we won't even put into the budget at the church. We'll actually build something or purchase something so you could see where your money went, which is how Emmett Park got built, which is how that baptistry got built, how the Emmett Park phase two with the premier pickleball course that's about to go out there in the fall, all of which has been from passionate about some pickleball right now. I love that is the 90-day tithing challenge. And at the end of the 90 days, when somebody goes, hey, listen, I don't feel like I'm blessed, we give them every dollar back. And we've had a few families choose to do that. It's not gimmicky. It's just trying to, we're a church that inspires people to be obedient to what the Bible says for them to do. And we don't assume that everybody's on the same long trajectory that you've been on for the past 30, 40 plus years. We got new believers in this room and we wanna shepherd their hearts respectfully, carefully, and tenderly. And matter of fact, over 324 families signed up for that at the beginning of the year, yielding $500,000 from that that will be a part of putting in that pickleball court there in the near future. And the only time we pass an offering bucket here, I don't know if you've ever been a part of one of these services, the only time we ever pass an offering bucket here is when we take up an offering and pass it out again for people to take out money that they actually need to pay some bills that maybe they've been struggling with. And if you've seen this, then you understand the heart of our church. We don't pass offering plates just to pass offering plates. We got boxes. I got pastors all the time going, Ed, how in the world... Do y'all do business this way? I go, listen, when God gets a, a hold of somebody's heart, they also, God gets a hold of their wallet. <laughs> so if we just go after the heart, listen to me, notice, notice the shift here. When you go after somebody's heart, you get the wallet. I ain't going to go after your wallet to get your heart. I want Jesus to have your heart. He'll deal with everything else. I want you to have a mindset. If there's a giant offering plate right here, and it was big enough to put a 10 and a half in, I want you to think about the best gift that you can give God is you. Because when God gets you, he gets your heart, your time, your talent, your treasure. Now listen to me. This is not just a conversation about money. This is about your abilities. Don't rob God, not just from finances, but don't rob God with your abilities that God has given you to maximize his name and fame with. Now listen to me. Hashtag not busted, but hashtag real talk. Our church was 14,200 people before COVID. Coming back into this building in September of 2020, 4,000 people in this room. We have now grown from September into this month of July. We're back at 11,000 people, nearly 11,000 people, which is exciting. I want you to listen to me. But there's a mindset in a church this size. They got people they'll pay to do everything else. That is not our mindset. Like we all get frustrated with big government. People get frustrated with big churches. You know why? Because they don't know where the money's going. And what we say is this. We want to hire strategically in key places. Here's the reason why. Because we believe the best gift that our church has is not the facilities, but the people. And you, with a talent, gift, and ability, could use this for the glory of Jesus. And I'm making this plea, and I'm making this appeal. 
we could use your talent, gift, and ability here at CBC as God's continue to grow our church. We could use some levels of leadership where you can come and be a part of what God's doing here at this church. Hey, sis, God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate you. And what you need to know is that, yes, and I'm great, like, love this. But I believe more than anything else, God wants your heart. He, want, he wants your heart. And when he gets your heart, he'll get everything else. And this is a church you could serve in. And we could use your help. Matter of fact, on the website, communitybible.com, you'll see ways to serve. And right there, a small tab, right there in blue, volunteer. I would encourage you to do that. As we bring this message to a close, testing God for his promises, trusting God in his provision, I will not stand on a stage and make it seem as if I'm holier than thou. It's not who I am. You know that. I'm a fellow struggler. And there was a moment I used to live in Memphis, Tennessee. And as I one day began to address the fact that I could not keep our landscaping up to par, plants were dying, and you could only take so many trees and plants back to Home Depot and Lowe's before they look at you and go, I don't think it's the tree's fault. It's you. So what I'm about to confess to you, my counselor says it's good for me to talk about stuff like this, so I'm going to talk about it out loud today. So 54 acres across from our subdivision, this is about 2008. Do you remember when the economy crashed and all, the thing, all things began to slow down? There was a moment across from our neighborhood, 40, or 54 acres about to be developed. Everything came to a screeching stop. There were what's known as cypress trees, like little Christmas trees. You've seen those grow in the wild. I was like, forget these plants I'm getting at Home Depot and Lowe's. I need something robust, something you ain't got to water. So I get my trailer, get my four kids, and we go into this 54-acre lot, and I dig up not just one tree, ten. And I put them in my front flower bed, take a step back, wipe the sweat from the brow, look good. A couple days later, I get in my vehicle, go preach at a conference. On my way back, my wife calls me. Her name's Stephanie. She was singing right here. She goes, Ed, you almost home. I go, yeah, baby, what's up? She goes, well, got home from church today. I was like, how's church? She's like, we'll talk about that later. I was like, okay. She's like, somebody broke into our shed and stole all your landscaping equipment. Lawnmower, weed eater, blower, shovels, rakes. Now, let me make this statement. I know it had nothing to do with the 54-acre lot. The owner didn't come and take my stuff because I took his 10 trees. I said, baby, I got to call you back. Have you ever had a conversation with the Lord like this? God, I'm seeking to be a man of character and integrity, preach the gospel, tell people about Jesus. And somebody's going to steal my weed eater? Come on, God. Somebody's going to steal my lawnmower? Come on, God. Somebody's going to steal my blower? Come on, God. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to live for you. And God goes, let's talk about those trees, Ed. <laughs> you ever had a conversation with God when he, he kind of leaned in on you and went, let's talk about those trees. I said, God, what about those trees? I'm just trying to save the planet. They were going to bulldoze those trees. I was just trying to go green. God's like, oh, don't do it, Ed. Don't rationalize and justify. Just own it. I said, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I get home. My kids are hugging me. I said, put on some play clothes. I said, I need your help. Because my kids had watched me put those trees in our front flower bed. And so all of a sudden, we're digging up these trees. My little girl, Liv, who's about to be in the 10th grade at that particular moment, blonde hair, pigtails, blue eyes, looked at me, and she said, Daddy, what are we doing? I looked at her and said, baby girl, listen to me. Daddy stole some trees. And I'm so sorry. We're going to go take them back. And we took those 10 trees back, put them right back in those holes, got them right, standing up straight. My daughter Lola, that's in the room right now, she's a little bit older than Liv. Lola... In the back of the minivan, we'd drive to school. She was probably in kindergarten, first grade at the time. From the back of the minivan. Hey, Daddy! Yeah, baby. Just the rear view mirror. Driving by that 54-acre lot, she goes, You remember that time you stole them trees? 
And Lola, you did that for six months. I tried to take a different route to school because I was tired of her asking. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is because the enemy, and I'm not saying Lola's the enemy, (laughs) by no means, she's my girl, but the enemy wants to remind you of all that you've done wrong. But grace covers all of our sin, myself included, but the way that we respond to that grace, we take back the trees. We make it right. What would your company look like? What would our companies look like? What would our places of employment look like, our schools? What would civilization and culture look like if we chose to live this way? Be different, would it not? Companies would not be losing $120 billion every year. One out of 52 people that walk into a supermarket walk out with something they didn't pay for. And we're watching on the news brazenness like I've never seen before of people walking into department stores and walking out with stuff. Why? Because the crime is the same as a parking ticket. With this thought, insurance will cover that. Still doesn't make it right. So we as the people of God got to live different, act different. And I believe for all of us in this room, leads to a place of action and course correction. And that's why I love you. Because you'll do what God tells you to do. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a brief moment. Father God, we heard a hard message today. Hard message. And we need to know that you're going to help us do the right thing. So messages like this convict us, but challenge us. But also there's comfort to know that we're forgiven. But help us not to squander that grace. But help us to choose to do the right thing. To restore and to make new if possible. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're not put your faith and trust in Jesus and you're in this room, I want to make a hard statement. Stealing ain't your problem. Not knowing Jesus is your greatest problem. And when Jesus gets your heart, he takes care of everything else. He'll align your life to him. And if you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus, say this to him. Many of you will need Jesus as your Savior. And today is that day. Say this to him. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect. But I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith, calling on the name of Jesus, would you raise your hand as tall as you can? Don't be embarrassed of this. You gave your life to Jesus today. God bless you. Keep your hand raised so somebody can high five you. Keep your hand raised so somebody can hug you. Keep your hand raised so people can clap a little bit louder for you right now. Come on, we got some new brothers and sisters in the house today. And praise God for that. Stop by CBC Cares. And how about this? For those of you who gave your life to Jesus, get baptized next weekend. If you gave your life to Jesus and you've not been baptized, our baptism party is next weekend. Sign up for that. But let's stand together. And as we stand, we believe that God's doing something at CBC and he's doing something in and through you. So let's be winsome. So, Father, we pray blessings over every single person in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next weekend.